Welcome to Case Unsolved. Tonight we reopen the files of the strange disappearance of a young woman from Manchester. We start by turning back time 70 years to the city of Liverpool, in the midst of the Great Depression. The murder of Julia Wallace is one of the most infamous crimes of all time. Her husband was found guilty of the crime here in this very courtroom and was later acquitted on appeal. No one else has ever been charged. Julia Wallace was murdered in her own home. She was battered about the head 11 times, but she was dead by the time the second blow fell. It was a dramatic end for a woman who in life had been described as a rather drab butterfly. Julia has had a very bad press. She'd be described as older than she said, dowdy, in the same clothes, not interested in her appearance. She's been described as quite plain, and that is the best description. Julia Wallace was an educated lady, I believe. She was of French descent. She came from a, a pretty wealthy background. She was upper middle class. And some people regarded her as marrying out of her class when she met uh, William Wallace, who was originally a draper. Julia and her husband, William, moved to Liverpool in 1915. They spent the next 16 years in a small terraced house in the Anfield area of the city. Julia kept house by day, as William did his rounds in the city, collecting insurance money. They lived what can only be described as a quiet life. If you believe William's diary, and much of it was written later, it was music, um, piano and violin. He played badly, she played the piano better. Um, he tries to create the idea of uh, hearthside musical duets. It's impossible to penetrate their marriage exactly. It's impossible to get behind the front door of Wolverton Street. The serenity of their lives was abruptly shattered on January the 19th, 1931, by a telephone call from a mysterious stranger. In just over 24 hours, Julia would be dead. Wallace had a successful insurance round in his own area. His main social activity, which Julia did not join in, was chess. Monday night was tournament night. Wallace was due to attend. A phone call is made to the club. He is not there. The Captain Beatty takes the call. Liverpool 319. Which tells him to advise Wallace no, that if he goes to an address the next night in Menlo Gardens, he will have business to his advantage. When Wallace arrives, Beatty faithfully gives him the message. William pondered the mysterious call during his chess match that evening. After taking advice on where the address might be, he resolved to investigate the promise of new business the following night. He went on that mission to find the address which did not exist. He even went to the house with the right number, but west instead of east, and he ascertained from an occupier that such an address did not exist. His pursuit is a pursuit in vain, and he returns home to find his wife dead upon the hearth. Julia was dead, but who was responsible? The only certainty was that whoever was behind the strange phone call to the city cafe was the killer. From the beginning of the police investigation, William Wallace became the prime suspect. I think that in the choosing of Wallace as the target, the police cannot particularly be blamed. In most cases, you will look for a domestic connection in these matters. The police took the view that there was a dead wife and therefore there must be a guilty husband. William Wallace became the chief suspect to a fault of the forensic investigation. When Whitley McFall called at the house, he didn't take the temperature of the body. So through this mistake, this gross error of calculating the time of death, he, he put William Wallace in the frame immediately, he must be lying. He, 
He couldn't have been going to men of God. He supposed to be murdering his wife. There was a great deal of evidence at the trial concerning this phone call. The strangest aspect of the phone call is the name. Not a Smith, nor a Jones, nor in even an Evans, but a Qualtro, of which there were not many. The proximity of the phone box to Wallace's house was only 400 yards from 29 Wolverton Street, so they thought. Why would this person who wants to talk to Wallace call from so close to his house? Unless he thought it was Wallace phoning up the chess club in a disguised voice, leaving a message for himself to provide himself with a perfect alibi. It was bound to have struck the police as a most curious alibi and was bound to have set them towards the obvious solution, which I suppose was husband, murder, wife. 14 days after the murder, Wallace was finally arrested. In April of 1931, he was brought to this room for his trial, which lasted three and a half days. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by Lord Justice Wright. And then, in May, he was freed by the Court of Appeal, a most unusual, surprising judgment. Though William Wallace was eventually cleared of his wife's murder, rumours about his guilt hung over him for the rest of his life. Two years after Julia's death, in 1933, Wallace passed away. But when you look at the diaries of William Herbert Wallace, you see that he really loved Julia. You know, these diaries stretch back over 10 years or more, you know, and about his undevoted love for her. The motive just doesn't stand up why he would kill her in his own house. Although Wallace had been acquitted, a question remained. If he didn't kill Julia, then who did? 50 years after the, the murder of Julia Wallace, a man came forward, just one man out of the, the many people who were involved in the murder, and he said that a man named Richard Gordon Parry had gone into Moscow Drive garage on the night of the murder with a bloody gauntlet in the glove compartment of his car. All right, could you clean this for me, inside and out? If you find this, I'll be hanged. I've never bought the Parry theory. I think Parry was a dreamer. He wanted to become an actor. Uh, he actually knew Wallace. He was at one time an employee of the Prudential Assurance Company, but got the sack after stealing £30. And it's been held that perhaps as a, the most has been revenge. He says, I'll get back at the person who sort of blew the whistle on me, who, who the alleged was William Wallace. I always found it rather fanciful that a man having committed murder would go and have his car washed out in dead of night and then would say to somebody, if the police find that glove, they'd hang me. My view on it was that it was no better and probably worse than some of the other theories. 70 years on, interest in the case is as strong as ever. Tom Slemon believes his new research finally proves who killed Julia Wallace. I can reveal after 70 years, in the opinion of myself and my colleague, who's a criminologist, Keith Andrews, that the murderer of um, Julia Wallace was none other than John Sharp Johnston, the next door neighbour. One person did come forward, and what he told us just blew us apart. He said, I knew John Sharp Johnston in his latter, the latter days of his illness at Westminster Road. He was actually in a place called Westminster House on, on Westminster Road in Kirkdale. It's basically an old people's home, and the man was dying of senile dementia. And he kept going on about the, the Anfield murder. And at one point, while he's rambling to himself, he said, I killed Julia Wallace. It's a tragedy, really. I think it's a robbery that's gone horribly wrong. I do not believe that the building blocks now exist, or that the evidence exists, that would help us to solve this case. But nonetheless, the field is still open for any new theories for the Wallace database. The case will forever remain a mystery. Legendary crime novelist Raymond Chandler once wrote that the case was unbeatable within the history of crime. Others have labelled it the perfect murder. However, such accolades can only mask the true horror of what happened that night in Wolverton Street. Because this case is better than the greatest of novels, people have had fun with it. But there are victims. Poor Julia, battered to death in her own house. Whatever she was, she was certainly harmless. Wallace, whatever he was, died within a year and a half, a most miserable and tragic death with four people at his funeral. 
and other people's lives that were affected by this dreadful case. Yes, it is a novel. Yes, it is the best of the whodunits, but it also destroyed people's lives. After 70 years, it seems likely the killer of Julia Wallace has taken his guilty secret to the grave. Still to come, though, the strange disappearance of a young mother from Manchester. Welcome back to Case Unsolved. We now reopen the files on the tragic case of young mother Zoe Simpson. Zoe led a troubled life. In the autumn of 1996, she disappeared from her home in Manchester. She vanished with no money, no change of clothes, and no real motive for leaving. Detectives are now convinced that she was murdered. Yet Zoe's body has never been found and the killer has never been caught. Macclesfield, Zoe Simpson's hometown and where she grew up, the youngest of two children. There's a little girl that always liked socialising. She was friend to everybody. She loved children. As a teenager, she was still very outgoing. She didn't like being in the house. She hated the rain when she had to stop in. But apart from that, she was just norm a normal teenager. She's typical of you know, any little girl, really. She was uh, very lively, very bouncy, always full of energy, very outgoing. Um, I remember a typical brother and sister, we never, you know, Nothing unusual, we fought just as much as any brother and sister would. She was uh, pretty much the opposite of me, I was always the quiet one, she was um, the outgoing one. Yeah, I was the first one to go up to somebody and say hello if you had a visitor at the house and I'd be hiding behind the sofa as a small kid. Yeah, she'd be running up there going, hello, who are you then? And uh, yeah, very much out of her shell, very much ready to meet somebody, um, put herself forward. At the age of 16, Zoe's lifestyle changed dramatically when she met and fell in love with Carl Richardson. He was quite a few years older than her, and a bit wild, um, always up for a party, always plenty of cash, and I think she was quite intrigued by, you know, the lifestyle. He was, you know, always had a bit of money to spend on her and uh, always up for a laugh. And because she couldn't decide what to do with herself, she just fell in with other people. She's a lovely person, thought the world of her. You know, she's very faithful, she was kind, she was honest. You know, I'd spent a fair few, you know, years of my life with her and what I enjoyed. The relationship was sealed when Zoe was 18 and she gave birth to a little girl, Nicole. Unfortunately, Nicole's birth triggered a severe bout of postnatal depression for Zoe. She was hospitalised in Mac for it. Uh, she was in hospital quite a while, and Nicole was kept in hospital. She was very lonely in that place. She, you know, she didn't mix with any of the other people, because I think they had a day room where they could go. I just don't think she realised where she was and what they were doing. And I suppose she came out when they thought she was fit to be out. She wasn't looking after herself. Every time she turned up, she'd be looking uh, unkempt, um, like she'd not been eating very well, and uh, just not taking care of herself like she used to. Nobody had been doing it for her. You know, there'd be nobody there looking after her to see that she wasn't her, her normal self. There'd be nobody to say, you know, what's wrong? Zoe's detachment from her family increased when she moved from Macclesfield and bought a house in the Longsight district of Manchester for herself and Carl Richardson. There was a lot of time that she wasn't in touch. Uh, we wouldn't hear anything and uh, we couldn't get in touch with them. If we'd try and phone them, they wouldn't answer the phone if they were in. And uh, you wouldn't hear anything from them. You wouldn't know she was safe or... And then all of a sudden she'd appear on the doorstep. Zoe lived a very private life. She'd moved to Manchester and she knew very, very few people. In fact, hardly anybody in Manchester. All her friends and family still were in Macclesfield. 
Uh, her partner was out working most of the day and he worked throughout the northwest. So that sometimes she would go out with him, but more often than not, she would be left at home in the house. To the surprise of her family, Zoe had another child, a little boy called Joseph. I never saw Joseph. She, she, she didn't even ring up to let me know he'd been born. But if she was as ill with Joseph as she was with Nicole, I shouldn't think she knew what she was doing. Zoe's isolation grew, and earlier in 1996, she disappeared from home for two nights and was found wandering the streets of Stockport. She was very ill. Um, she was so disorientated, so depressed, she didn't know what was going on, and she just wandered. And uh, again, it wasn't reported, and it's just lucky that no harm came to her during that time. The last independent sighting of Zoe was on September the 16th. She was attending a daycare centre for help with her postnatal depression. She went to the centre on Monday and was due to return on the Tuesday, but Zoe never turned up for that appointment. Uh, it would be the 26th of October, 1996. One Saturday morning when I went left for work, when I returned, she wasn't, she wasn't there, you know. Well, first of all, she was reported in October of 96 by her partner's mother. We, the police were then treated it as a missing from home. She was a missing person at that stage. But we were very, very concerned, even then, because we've got a young 24-year-old woman who's gone missing and no trace of her at all. And she had two young children. And a young child was quite ill at the time. When she went missing and when she was reported missing I thought it was another case that she got very depressed that she'd lost you know she didn't know who she was and that she was in just such a haze that she'd wandered off somewhere and for several months I was hoping that maybe she'd been picked up by somebody maybe she was in a hostel somewhere um, that she just wandered off and somebody somewhere was caring for her she just totally disappeared. She'd been to the clinic on the Monday. She had a very good day. And she was looking forward to going back the following day. And it was a surprise to the hospital staff, that um, the clinic staff, that she didn't turn up on the Tuesday. This was strange. Uh, no money was missing and no contact with the children. Again, this was all strange. And this all suggested that something serious has happened to Zoe. Well, over the weeks and months that followed her uh, reporting missing, uh, the police found uh, bits of evidence which suggested that Zoe was now dead. We contacted as many people as we possibly could who were friends, relatives, who knew her in, um, uh, previously in Macclesfield and of course throughout Manchester. Uh, but no one at all had any information as to uh, where she might be. We were then realised we were treating this as a murder investigation. As the investigation progressed, information came in, again over in Macclesfield, and as a result, we did some searching in the, uh, the Turf Moss area, an area which was known to Zoe that she would have uh, visited. Uh, but unfortunately, we found uh, no trace. It was to be two years before detectives had another lead in the case. This time, it took them to a scrapyard in Stoke-on-Trent. The intelligence suggested at that time that Zoe's body was disposed of by use of uh, a particular piece of machinery in this scrapyard. It's referred to as a shredder. Most cars in scrapyards are, are not disposed of this way. They are what they refer to as baled, where they are made into cubes uh, by uh, hydraulics. This machine actually dismantles a car by crushing it and uh, it takes it apart in seconds. I think to say uh, to look for needle in a haystack was optimistic. It, it, that's the kind of scale we're talking about. It's a huge piece of machinery and it would dispose of literally thousands of cars a week. One of the main highlighted areas was like a sludge cum slurry tank, which is towards the end of the process. The way it cleaned itself uh, allowed a uh, possibility of there being material in it that could have been there uh, for quite some time. And uh, then uh, specialist uh, tactical aid unit officers, rope access team, were able to empty the tank uh, somewhere in the region of around about two tonnes of material removed from the tank some taken away to the university at Manchester where it was searched in great detail by the staff there and some was we were able to search on site. 
So far, the search has provided no concrete evidence. There were uh, some finds which, even to this date, uh, technology is not in a position uh, to identify exactly what they are. They're such small fragments of material, smaller than a pinhead. Um, hopefully, we, we obviously keep possession of those, and as technology advances, who knows? Five years after her disappearance, Zoe's body has still not been found, and the events that led up to her murder have still not been explained. Who says she's dead? To me, she's just a missing person. What? You know, where's the proof that she's dead? How can they honestly say that she's died? She's dead. She's been murdered. They don't know this. They know as much as I know, and that's that. Just at the beginning, I thought she may have just gone because everything was too much for her. But as time go on and the police make their inquiries and nothing happens, then you really think about it, you know, and think, I don't think she's alive. But there's no body. This is the worst thing. If there was a body, you could put an end to everything. You know, you could bury it and everything, but there's nothing. We are convinced that there are people, people out there, perhaps very close to Zoe, who know what's happened, know what's happened to Zoe and where Zoe is. We believe she's dead. It's an ongoing murder investigation. Zoe has left two young children. It's now time, it's years on, and it's now time that people search the conscience and come forward. I accept that she's dead and uh, that's it. I still want justice. I want uh, justice for Zoe, for her children. I want the person that killed her to be brought to justice. And I want the family to be able to lay her to rest. Detectives are still determined to catch Zoe's killer. So if you've got any information that can help, Please call in confidence the Crime Stoppers number we'll be showing in a moment. Next week, a single stab wound to the back killed Lynn Trenholm. It was then that her family discovered that she was leading a double life. Until then, good night.